So I have a K-State shirt on today, and many people were saying, didn't K-State get beat out in the bracket? And I would say, yes, they did, but they're still my team. Um, amen. I'll, I, I'm a fan. So, but on the way off of the platform last week, I kind of... I kind of said something that I probably shouldn't have said. I said that I would be first place in the bracket. And I also said that I don't think there's been a woman that ever beat me in the bracket. Which I clearly had misspoken. Uh, because I think there's 42 teams in the Glenville bracket. And my two brackets are 37 and 38. <laughs> but here's what took place. This is what happened. Is he in here? Wayne Moult. Where's Wayne Moult at? Is he in here? Here's what happened. I finished my bracket, and I had that bracket filled out, and Wayne texts me, and he said, I can't figure out the bracket. What is your email address and password? So I gave him my email address and my password. All of a sudden, I had the number one and the number two picks until he got that, and all of a sudden, I'm down to 37 and 38. So honestly, I think it's Wayne's fault. Anybody agree with me and believe me? Surely your pastor would not lie. I stink at brackets, let me just say that. <laughs> anyway, uh, he didn't do that. That was me just being a terrible college challenge. So, Anyway, I serve. There's a particular person in the disciples that changed the complexity of how the disciples and the church worked. Now you would think somebody by the name of Peter or somebody by the name of Paul or John or Luke would have changed the complexity of the disciples. But it was a young man by the name of Barnabas, a son of the encourager that changed the complexity of how the church was even going to be established. And in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 31, Here's the deal. The road to Damascus experience was done. Paul was now blinded by God. And now he is a converted believer in Jesus. But the disciples were afraid of Paul because he was a persecutor of the Christians. He hated the church. And he would do anything within his power to kill or to destroy any believer. And all of a sudden now... Paul comes into the disciples' arena, and the disciples are scared. They're scared for their life. And they're saying, why should we let this man, he could be doing all kinds of tricks. He could be doing things just to get close to us so he could kill the church. And this is where Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 31. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join his disciples, but they all were what? afraid of him, and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them in Jerusalem, coming in and out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. But they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Now this is what happens when you're afraid and you start doing what God wants you to do. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and they were edified. And walking in fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Through the persecution, when we accept what God is going to do within our life, a man by the name of Barnabas saw the real power that Paul had and he brought them into the inner circle. And when they brought them into the inner circle, Paul became the most recognizable person of the New Testament. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But Paul would have never been again into the inner circle of the disciples if it was not for Barnabas. I want you to listen to this quote. Commitment is doing the thing you said you were going to do long after the mood that you said it has left you. You know, sometimes we get, I want to serve here, and we get excited about what we want to do, and I want to do it, but you know what? When that excitement leaves, 
I'm still committed to what I said I was going to do. And true commitment is even if the excitement is gone, I'm still committed to what I said I was going to do. Commitment. Serving. There's some aspects that we have to talk about. Why? We have a, a church full of individuals. So why are we afraid? Well, the first one is the fear keeps us from taking risks of serving others. The disciples were fearful of Paul. They were fearful of him. And sometimes when we are asked to do something or when we are in the midst of something, sometimes fear overwhelms us. Sometimes we are fearful of the unknown. Anybody ever fearful of the unknown? Really not knowing what tomorrow has in store? Um, I had a lunch yesterday with my good friend Jerry Thorpe. And uh, Jerry found out uh, uh, just a month ago that he has prostate cancer. And uh, so he called, he called the doctor and they're starting to do the process with, with the cancer. And, and he talked to uh, his doctor's nurse. And they, he said, hey, how's the x-rays doing? And, and uh, the nurse says, Jerry, you, um, you have a couple masses on your kidneys. And Jerry goes, well, I, I was told prostate. Now you're saying you have masses on your kidneys. And he fell on his face and started praying and started talking to Freddie. And, and they were concerned. So they got, they got into their car and they drove down to the doctor. They wanted to see what was going on because, you know, they can maybe deal with prostate cancer. But now he's talking about kidney cancer. So he went down to the doctor's office, fearful of the unknown, fearful of what tomorrow has in store. We went to the doctor and he said, doctor, can I have a consultation? And the doctor said, yes. And the doctor brought in the x-rays. And he said, oh, no, Jerry. That's not cancer. That's a growth. But it's not cancer. So for a few hours, where Jerry thought his life was going to be over in a very short time, the fear of the unknown. And he said, Bruce, could you imagine when you feel like your life is almost over, you had a full, healthy life, and all of a sudden, you get some news that it's over. Sometimes we are fearful of the unknown. What they may ask you to do, they say, I've never tried that before. And sometimes when we're serving, when we are asked to do something, and we say, I don't know. I don't know if I'm any good at that. I don't know if I can do that. Sometimes the unknown keeps us from doing what God truly wants us to do. And then we fear that there's not enough time. You know, I, I'm busy. I've got 16 baseball tournaments this weekend, you know, this year. I've got four kids. I've got a wife. I've got kids. I've got a job. I'm working two jobs. And everything is just so overwhelming to me. And, you know, sometimes in life, the greatest way to get a handle in life is to serve someone else. Because in everything that we do, if we are so busy and we won't serve and volunteer to serve somebody else, that busyness will take over our life. Sometimes we say that if I volunteer, I'll have no personal time. And here's what Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4 and 5 says. He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her with a child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. You may not be able to understand everything that's going to take place. Or can you? But what we can do is we can say, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I want to serve. I want to be someplace where you can use me. So sometimes fear captivates us. But the other thing that captivates more than fear is doubt. Insecurities. Doubt says, I'm not talented enough or knowledgeable enough to help. We just don't feel important. I like what uh, uh, WGOD said. Have you thought about just passing out at the front door, passing out flyers? <laughs> I'm, no, oh, I, I need something more than that. But I cannot tell you how many times that people have come to our church 
And I've met with them 10 years later. And they said, I remember. I remember that old man that passed out flyers at the front door. And I said, that old man? He said, yeah, nicest old man. Had a smile on his face. You mean Vernon? Yeah, that old man, Vernon. He was the nicest man in your church. And you know what I get to say? He hasn't changed a bit. You know, the most influential person in this church is not me. The most influential person in this church is the connection that they get with them walking these doors. You have no idea who walks through these doors. You have no idea the drugs, the alcohol, the abuse, the attempted suicide over the last night. You have no idea the insecurities that people have when they walk in these doors. They have no idea the room of a church is so overwhelming to some. And they're fearful to walk through these doors. And you know what they need? It's the same thing that you and the same thing that I need. Security. A handshake. You're welcome. Can I help you? Now when they walk in a door, the most important person in this room is the person that sticks out their hand and shakes their hand and loves them and helps them, offers them a donut, offers them a cup of coffee, and we stay with them. That is the leader within the church. So you don't feel unimportant. Well, you may say, you say but look at the perspective. You know, I'm, I'm nothing compared to, to that lady that volunteers over in Africa over her spring break and she spends her money and she raises money and she goes over to Africa and, and helps the feeding centers and the orphanages. I can't do anything like that. And you know what? That lady that spends her time to go to Africa over spring break, she didn't start volunteering in Africa over spring break. She started volunteering in a church by saying yes to a simple thing and saying yes to something else. And all of a sudden, God gives to her passions. She may have started off feeling unimportant. But when you start having success with serving others and loving others, God does those great things within your heart. And now all of a sudden, five years down the road and ten years down the road, a small choices that we make of success of serving can go overwhelming and you say you know what I want to try something new Bruce when is the next missions trip what can we do where can we serve and we just start saying because it's not about me it's about them we have an idea that you know what I could love to serve I love going on mission trips with our teenagers with our college kids it's awesome to see what they do they they transplant their heart away from their home and they give it to others and they start saying I can be a servant Somebody says sometimes that we just don't have enough to offer. We just don't do anything. I can't communicate. I, I, I'm kind of shy. I really don't know what to do. So really God has nothing that I can do. And that is so far, so far off. Because God can use any person with a willing heart. Whether it's being at prayer time, or whether it's being a hospitality, or whether it's just ministering to individuals. Everybody has things to offer. Everything can be done. So fear, and then doubt. And then this is a big one for those that have been in the church for some time. is cynicism. Cynicism says, I've tried to help before, and it didn't go well. Cynicism keeps us from taking risks and serving others. We tried volunteering and it didn't meet our expectations. It didn't go the way I thought it should go. I didn't like who was in there. They made me do something that I didn't want to do. Even when we have that initial excitement and, and we say, I would like to try to do something, a volunteer says, it's not what I want. So what we have to do is we have to get off the idea when we volunteer, not everything is going to go the way you want it to go. In life, does everything go your way? Absolutely not. In volunteering within a church, not everything goes the way I thought it was going to go. But sometimes we have to say, you know what, just like our car may have a flat tire every once in a while, sometimes we have to stop and evaluate, and sometimes we have to change that flat. In ministry, sometimes we have to change what we do. See, what I would tell every every volunteer within this church. Volunteer. 
But if it is not for you, change. Do something different. If you're getting burned out in one area, don't quit God and say, I'm not going to serve him. Let me try a different arena. Because that infusion of trying new things could absolutely change the way you see God. Sometimes we say, well, I tried, but nobody really called me back. Nobody from the church asked me. And that's why we're trying to do the tables in the back and sign up and get people back with you. And we want to make sure if you signed up to serve, we want to make sure that we give you that role and we help you out. And one time that we just say that we just, um, we just fill out a place. We just fill out a place at the church. Uh, we don't feel like this is what God wants me to do. And I want to say this with my bottom of my heart. We want every person to feel secure at this church. We want to be able to minister to you, and we want you to be able to minister to others. There has to be a place within the body of Christ to serve each other. And if we, feel, if we just feel out of place, if we feel like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that much, or maybe it's a Bible study and, and you're afraid somebody's going to ask you a question. Or you're afraid that you can't deliver some goods. We must find a place for you to serve. If this is where God has called you to serve. If this is where God has called you to worship. God did not call us to sit. God called us to worship. And the way that we worship is not only with our voices and hands. Not only with our preaching and not only with the scriptures. He has called us to worship by serving. The greatest joy that we can get is when somebody needs you. Somebody is struggling. Somebody that you love. And they come up to you. And they say, I need you. And you deliver. You serve them. You serve them. Then and only then will you feel in place. Ephesians 3.20 now to him who is able to do unmeasurable more than all that we could even ask or think. I love when he says unmeasurable. He can do more for us than we could even think about and even dream about. So let me ask you these questions. How can we be a Barnabas to others? So I think this is very important. How can we be a Barnabas to others? We are in the church. We are the disciples. And somebody from outside gets converted. And they may have been a, a hellion on the outside. But they come into this church. You know, this church is very unique compared to other churches. Because we want those hellions in this church. We want those individuals that gave their life to Jesus Christ and is trying to follow after Christ. And what we can do is we can serve them. And we can love them. And we can help them. But what they need is they need a Barnabas. They need a Barnabas that's going to walk over to them. And walk with them through life. And to try to help them and train them. Take the time to see what fits for you. Take the time to see where you're interested in. And what is it that God can do within your life. You may say, I just don't know where that would be. There are so many good serving opportunities. Which one is for me? What is your fit? What is your fit and what can you do? Or verify the facts. Verify the facts. We are trying to get in front of you the leaders of every ministry that, is, that are needing volunteers. In front of you, you saw the individuals. So if you're saying... What can I do? What should I do? Go to that leader and say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Can I still serve? Can I do something within the church? See which department is in need of you. Not in need of volunteers. Because you have been gifted by God. Which one of the departments needs you? You. Because you're needed. It may not be where you think you're needed, but you are needed and God can give it to you. And then we have to trust in God's power. We may say we think that we can't make a difference. What am I in such a big of an issue? 
we can't even make a dent into the problem. I, I would go into the nursery and there's 50 kids back there and my hair would be pulled out and I, I just don't know what to do. What, what, what am I in such of a big issue? What we have to do is just like Barnabas did. Barnabas took a man and he had confidence in him and he was an encourager and Paul changed the world. So there's people that what we have to do is we have to look at how can I serve and how can I love and how can I be part of a missions team or how can I be part of a youth ministry or children's ministry or the worship team? How, how can I just serve? How can I serve? And the idea is do something. Do something. In Psalms chapter 119 verses 105 it says this. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So often... The reason why we don't serve is because we want to see what's going to take place a year down the road. We want to see what the ministry is going to look like after I'm in it for a month. You know what the Bible says? A lamp to my feet. That means he wants to give you direction for the next step. Because if we do not rely on him for the next step, we're going to take our own step. He doesn't want you to see where you're going to go five years from now or ten years from now or fifteen years from now. He cares about, are you taking the step today? Take this step. Take this step. Take this step. And a small gradual change and a small gradual choice in the same direction and an ultimate result will be, I have followed after God. When I do premarital counseling, I say this to all my couples. I say it all the time. You have to have a dream. You have to have a vision. You got to know where you want to be 15 years from now. But every day, every day, you have to love your wife. You have to love your husband. You have to sacrifice on a daily basis. Every day. If you do not sacrifice daily, there will be no vision fulfilled in the future. So often, we get so caught up in what tomorrow may be. We look back at our lives now and say, what do we have now? And ultimately, we will never have a vision if we don't have it today. And in our ministry, and in our church, He is going to be a light unto our path. That means I have to die daily. And I have to say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Today. It may be when you leave here, something has happened. And the Holy Spirit prompts you and say, that person that you just passed, that was my plan for you. That person that needed you, that was my person that I planted to see if you would need me. There's people that God uses to see where we are in our life. And God not only uses you to serve others, but here's the big one. God uses them to help you. So when somebody comes up alongside of you and says, can I help you? Can I serve you? And sometimes, oh, uh, no, I, I got this under control. No, you don't. We can be honest. And sometimes God has orchestrated a divine moment of you needing someone and they coming together. And that divine moment is God. And what we can do is we can serve in the midst of a God movement. Whether somebody is there to give you help. Or you're there to give somebody else hope. What it is. It's service. It's serving who? God. That's who we're serving. You're not serving the church. You're not serving the security team. You're not serving the worship team. In everything that we do. We serve God. So. It makes no difference. Whether you start in the nursery and you say, you know what, I've had enough of the nursery. I'm going to serve in the Iwanas. Or you say, you know what, I've been in the Iwanas for 10 years. Maybe, maybe I want to serve in the drama department or maybe on the worship team or maybe in the children's ministry. The idea is find what works. And when you find what God has gifted you in, you're not serving out of obligation. You're serving out of love. And when you serve out of love, 
God can do great things within your life. Serve. Many of us. Many of us early on in our ministry, we were hungry. We were hungry for just God to use us. Use us any way that you can use us. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And we, we tried many different things. And sometimes what we tr tried, we, we failed at. And we had to, you know, let me try something else. And we tried something else. And, you know, I tried the children's ministry thing. I tried, and, and it, my, I had a music director that even said, Bruce, you need, to, you need to sing a song with me. I said, ah, oh, really? He goes, yeah, I, I believe God wants you to sing. I said, okay. So I got up and sang. It was Sunday, got up to sing, and um, I sang. And then uh, he goes, he goes, he goes I, Bruce, I recorded that. So, okay. So he played the recording. That was back in the cassette tapes. I went back to the sound system. I broke that CD, broke it in half, and did every, I said, nobody will ever hear that song again. God did not gift me in music, period. I know that. That's why you never have to worry about that. God may have gifted you in music, and he may not have gifted you in something else. But what we can't say is, I'm not good at this thing, so I'm not going to try anything. What we have to say is, I wasn't good at this thing. There has to be something else I can do. Don't quit because you're not good at something. Find what God wants you to do. And do it. That's what our call is. That's what the mandate is. And Barnabas just said, I'm not going to let the disciples say no. This guy is part of us. We need him to serve with us. And it changed everything about us. So you guys may be the Barnabas. Some of us may be a Paul. Some of us may just need somebody to come alongside us and help us out. And encourage us. And we could change the whole dynamics of our life. But we have to pray. We have to seek God's face. And we have to be willing to do this as a church. Where can I serve? Not do I have to serve. Not I don't want to serve. Where can I serve? Whether it's small or whether it's great. What we must do is serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Now. Out of everything. And why? It's because of what he has done for us. You know, Jesus died for us. And because he died for us, he's asked us to build his church. And we build his church by serving each other.